Austin Apple and with National Lewis and with um, FAN, uh, Family Action Network on the North Shore. For now it is our fourth year of this phenomenal series where we bring two great thinking minds together on the stage for the first time and energy and synergy happens with the help of an equally um, just intellectually challenging and curious moderator. And it's just curious in the best of ways. It's just wonderful what goes on here. And so we're really, really excited that you are here to be part of this with us. This stage now, Windsor, England, um, in the middle of winter, um, is a place of great dramas taking place. And I don't know of a more significant drama to be telling the story of and what our education should be looking like um, and what the role of creativity should be as we move ahead in thinking about our schools and in reimagining what we need to be doing as we move into this um, next era of teaching. So I'm now going to introduce to you my buddy and my colleague and friend from way back, Dom Belmonte, who is the president of Golden Apple. Thank you, Marilyn, and thank you all for dodging whatever pothole you did to get here and for those that you will encounter on your way back. It's nice of you to come out on a Monday night in January. We were so lucky with the weather, uh, and uh, I am, as Marilyn echoed, grateful to Chicago Shakespeare for hosting this event and for Mark Larson, the inimitable Mark Larson, and National Lewis University for the partnership that we have. And our new partner is with the Family Action Network, who is going to help us bring in uh, more uh, interesting speakers like we have for tonight. And I also want to thank you for being, by your presence here, to a certain degree, champions of creativity in the school experience. There is a day that I fear coming where we're going to bring our students to a point where they are going to be so adept at filling in boxes that they will exit into a world that is boxless. And they will come out into the world and see above their heads uh, drones, armadas from Amazon.com, uh, <laughs> where the boxes have been uh, rendered useless. And one could look up and say to the student, uh, look like Icarus ascending, as Joni Mitchell sang, on beautiful, foolish arms. To, they'll say, Icarus? Uh, who's that? <laughs> oh, wikipedia.com will have all the answers that you need. Uh, to the time that we, we hope that this conversation in the next hour and a half will show you a perspective that we find fascinating, with people that we find terrific to this, with a moderator who is going to be able to draw out a conversation that I think will return the splendid art of conversation on topics of importance for us to consider as we, in this town especially, forge onward with trying to make the better tomorrow happen for the children we care about so much in this town and throughout the state. So to help us with this, our able companion from WBEZ, may I introduce Allison Cuddy. Hi, thank you so much, Dom. I sort of got nervous that I was gonna actually slip on those stairs as if that's real ice and real snow. <laughs> Still recovering from that cold spell from a little while ago. Uh, it's great to see all of you here, and thanks, Dom, thanks, Marilyn, thanks to Chicago Shakespeare for hosting us once again. Um, just a couple of uh, housekeeping notes, so we'll have a conversation with our two interlocutors, and then of course we'll open the floor to your questions um, and comments, and please have those in the form of a question or a comment, because we want to try to get to as many different people as we can. I know there will be lots of interesting um, feedback from all of you. So we'll talk for about 25 minutes, and then we'll have your questions and comments, and then we'll wrap up around eight, and go into the main lobby for a reception and there'll be the opportunity to talk more there. Um, if you can't contain yourself before then, you can, we have an outlet for you. You may have heard of it, it's called Twitter. And uh, we have a hashtag for tonight. We have a hashtag. 
It is uh, hashtag all cap CIE14. Okay, CIE14. So please feel free to comment via that and have conversations with your um, fellow attendees as we're having this event. So um, let's get though to the main event, to our two wonderful guests tonight. And I want to first welcome Linda Keene to the stage. She's a professor of architecture and environmental design at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And she's also the co-founder and creative director of the e-learning designopedia, next.cc. So if you have your iPad or your smartphone, you can actually go check that website out. It's an eco-web that develops ethical imagination and environmental stewardship. And she's also an architect partner of Studio 1032. And there she collaborates with diverse communities on ecological urban initiatives along the Milwaukee-Chicago corridor. And she makes that trek back and forth frequently. I'm very happy that she made it this evening. Please welcome Linda Keene. Um, our next guest and I have already bonded over our shared oppositional defiance disorder. <laughs> which we learned early in our educational systems, I guess. Uh, Dr. Yang Zhao is an internationally known scholar, author, and speaker whose work focuses on the implications of globalization and technology on education. And the bulk of his academic work, including his PhD, was done right here in our state at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. His most recent book, which I really enjoyed reading, is World Class Learners. It's won several awards, including the Distinguished Achievement Award in Educational Leadership. And Dr. Zhao currently serves as the Presidential Chair and Director of the Institute for Global and Online Education in the College of Education at the University of Oregon. And he's a professor there in the Department of Educational Measurement, Policy, and Leadership. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Zhao, Yang Zhao. So um, I want to start, I was really fascinated that though you come from very, very different backgrounds and have very different approaches, there's a lot of overlap between the two of you and the kind of work that you do. I mean, one is something that I think many people in this room share, this sense that our current model of education works not to necessarily produce creative citizens, but to encourage obedience and conformity and to create good employees. Um, you both argue that making is a really critical element of education. I'm very fascinated to hear more about that, the role of making in education. Um, and then you both agree that our educational sh system is long overdue for what we call a paradigm shift, a radical overhaul. So I thought we should start tonight by really digging into what your paradigm is and talk a little bit more about a central figure within that paradigm. And for you, Yang Zhao, it's the idea of the entrepreneur, of creating students who are entrepreneurs. So can you give us a sense of why the entrepreneur? I mean, that's a fascinating figure and I wonder why it's at the center of your model of education. Sure, uh, th thank you. Uh, thanks everybody for coming here. It's, uh, it's great to be here in a much warmer day. Uh, thank you for making <laughs> this happen for me. And uh, well, I think the entrepreneur part of education comes really from my own concern about uh, today's children. My son is sitting right there. Uh, luckily, I think he has a job at arts uh, club. <laughs> and uh, you know, look at him, he, he went to the University of Chicago and unlike any other Chinese kid, he did not major in banking. You know, that's uh, it's, uh, so I, I got very concerned about. And, and then look at the global data. In the U.S., we got 53% of uh, college graduates, recent graduates, are unemployed. So I have been trying to define what means to have a good education. So uh, I think we have the today with the risk to the top, we call college and career readiness. I don't think that's going to cut it because with 53% of college graduates not moving out of, not having a job. So now my new definition of a good education is one that moves your kids out of your basement. Mm 
<laughs> and uh, and so that that's the uh, and that I think that's the challenge we have. It's uh, today with the 53 percent of college graduates in their parents' basement, only on average $23,000 in college debt. That's not going to work. And so then you look at uh, global data. Actually, global in Spain, uh, in any European countries, massive unemployment among youth. So what it means is basically four major factors that happening now when most of us are living longer. We don't die that often. And then they, we hold the jobs for longer. And we have a huge population. Then machines replace a lot of jobs. And, and of course, outsourcing. So that's the challenge. But then our traditional schools, the old paradigm is to prepare employees to look for jobs. So we look for jobs. But then when those jobs disappear, what's going to happen? So what I'm arguing that we have to prepare children to create jobs today, not to look for jobs. But our schools have been preparing employees for a long time. And then the, the trouble, the more troublesome, Alison, is that today in the US, you know, every school so far follows the traditional paradigm called employee-minded. We try, every school is designed to kill the creative and entrepreneur spirit in our students. But some school systems do it better than others. Like uh, Asian, uh, American schools, we don't teach creativity any better than Asian countries, but we cure it less successfully. So the problem now, <laughs> with our education reform today, the reform race to the top, no child behind, is trying to make us a better creativity killing machine, like the Asians. So we want to cure it better, that's why we have the problem. So we got to shift the paradigm, but now our reforms are shifting us the wrong way. Okay, we'll come back and talk a little bit about <laughs> how we create <laughs> entrepreneurs and help creativity grow, not die, on the vine. But uh, Linda, let's talk about your model because um, although it may have much in common with entrepreneurs, you really focus on students as artists yes. and designers. Absolutely, students and teachers. And before I answer, I just want to say thank you to the Golden Apple, Carol Bros, Penny Lundquist, Mark Larson from National St. Louis Dom, for in inviting me here to have this opportunity because usually I'm talking to teachers in their classroom and students who don't have access to art education, which basically makes me think that I am in a prison. So, um, yes. Uh, I am a university professor, and as you know, the university ideas are really scintillating from the Art Institute. It is absolutely a place where creativity flourishes. The faculty, the students, even the staff, I'm sure even the custodial staff are making things at home because it's contagious. Creativity is contagious. And when I read Don, uh, Yang's book about world-class learners, I began to look at how many art how many students are not able to take art in this country? Arne Duncan reports that 50% of eighth graders have art, um, maybe, maybe. And we begin to see that middle school is where that notion falls off. Ken Robinson interviews kindergartners, and they go, I'm all creative. By middle school, there's the jocks, there's the smart people, and there's the artist. And then by high school, they're really just the artists who are in the few schools that have art. And you've all probably read Daniel Pink. You may not all be Dolly or Degas, but you must all be a designer. And the point is, we were born to learn. That's what the human condition is. We were born to create, and we were born to be designers. Now, in this country, there's only three states that have art and design standards. There is not even a bookstore that has a design section in it. Lots of self-help, because we need help now, because we have no outlet for our creativity. <laughs> <laughs> and so even though uh, we have these other positions, we begin to do workshops with kids who don't have art, who have never picked up a pencil, never glued two pieces of paper together in middle school. And it is addictive. It is transformational. And we would like that to happen and be possible for all children in this country. So, okay, <laughs> I have a lot of questions. I mean, let's just talk a little bit about design as a model for education. Yes. Because I can, I understand how design, and I mean, it is an incredible field mm -hmm. and how designers work. But what does that look like when you're in the second grade or you're in high school? I mean, what are you doing in school? Well... 
design is an absolutely wonderful process to engage not only creativity, but its counterpoint, critical thinking. There's a wonderful uh, video by um, Exponentiary Learning about, I think it's called Anson's Butterfly, and a little boy drew a butterfly. And instead of the teacher saying, very good, you get an A, your butterfly is done, the teacher asks a group of children. Now here's the picture of the butterfly that Anson drew, and this is the picture he drew it from. Now we take the same exercise, we do it with fourth graders, fifth graders, sixth, seventh, eighth, twelfth graders, kids in college, teachers. And guess what? They then can stop for a minute and say, well, what would you do to make this drawing better? And the teacher doesn't have to tell them. They can see for themselves. So these little kids go, well, I think the wings should be a little bit like this. So Anson goes back and makes it better. And then they said, well, it could be yellow and a little more pointed. Design begins to get you to look at what is around you. So if you begin to have that ability, just like art, to look very closely wherever you are, it transforms how you look at the rest of the world. So this gets to the point that children in our schools know that the rainforest is being depleted, which is a global issue. But they cannot walk out of their school and name the trees on their schoolyard. There's a gap. OK. <laughs> Design is, so we'll talk more about making things, but I wanted, um, when thinking about that, like engaging students in a <laughs> process and, and sort of like creating something and then looking at it and how can you improve it, I mean, it sounds a lot like, but maybe not quite the same thing as a process that's really central to your model, and that is the product-oriented learning. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that? <clears throat> yeah, sure. I think the... Um that's where I, I would like to add something to what Linda was talking about. Yeah. First of all, creativity is not limited to arts. And mm -hmm. arts are not necessarily creative. And a lot of art <laughs> education schools are not creative at all. Okay, so that's not... <laughs> is that's that because, a, of the, because of the, the field the of art or teach. because of the no, overarching I think the, school? Any discipline can be creative and right. can mm -hmm. be done not creative. Absolutely. You know, so actually, art education can be the best way to stifle artists. It's, it's, it's beautiful, it's done. It's, 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 uh, so I, think we, I don't think any discipline, so you talk about design, it's really about what design, we can design social relationships, for example. Mm -hmm. Students who are into relationship design social circles, so they don't have a design, th those things. I think the 21st century, I just go back a little bit to say, you know, we have a crisis in this country called the disappearance of the middle class. The traditional middle class is disappearing. Traditional middle class were those great employees hired by Henry Ford. So in the past century, we valued a very limited uh, spectrum of talents, you know, math, Abilities. science, reading, you know, all, all those kind of things. Today, we have expanded. So the new middle class is the creative class. I mean, today is everybody. If I look at, if, if Lady Gaga is useful, anyone can be useful. And so that, that's the idea. So we have to celebrate the rise of different talents, of undervalued talents. So that, but how do we help that undervalued talents? And it's, like, uh, uh, then it's about through this design process. People making products, solutions, programs, or services that's of value to them. So design is a thinking process that you aim to create something and then it's not just in, just in case learning. In, you know, now today we are doing in case learning. In the future employment, you might need this. In a design thinking, is that I'm making something, I will need knowledge to do that. And also design thinking fosters growth mindset. That is, yes. I can improve. You are not proud. You can create the first butterfly perfect. Mm -hmm. You should be proud you can make a more perfect butterfly next iteration. Also yeah. design, think about collaboration. It design for you, think about audience. You have to serve somebody, a community. Mm -hmm. So that's, when I talk about product-oriented learning is that children need to think about making something that serves a purpose. So most people think of design as nouns, buildings, objects, cars, planes. Yes, it, it is all of those objects and many more that humans have created. But design is also an incredible lens by which to look at the world and to critically take information from the world, organize it, synthesize it, respect it, and begin to put it together to contribute to making things to make the world better. I mean, that's the whole goal. 
But what's, what seems to be a difference that you really are driving at, and I think you, you're thinking about this too, is, is that end result. Like, we talk a lot about project-based learning in terms of school. What we now call, it's our fancy term for like, you know, I mean, it could be anything from doing an art project, right? Mm -hmm. right. Or doing a presentation in class, all this project-based learning. But what's different for your model, from what I understand, is like, you really want something created that's useful in mm -hmm. the real world to right. a real audience. Yeah. It's not like you talk in your book about, like my kids brought all sorts of things home from doing projects yeah. in school and they're great, but they're not great. I mean, they're, yeah, they're, they're fine. Yeah, they get an A, but that's, that's it. Yeah. But right. Yeah. I, I think what's, the thing is that I grew up in a little, on a little farm in China. So that's why I tell people, first of all, know what you're not good at. I always tell people, I might be a successful professor, but I am a failed peasant to begin with. <laughs> so you got to recognize where you're not good. But on that farm, you have to understand one thing is about today's education for the last century, it's actually a distorted education. We sp put kids for t about 12,000 hours to yeah. study for a future job, which is really silly. It's in a 12,000. What we are training our kids to do is to find answers to what a teacher wants. So there's no meaning in those things. We said, mm -hmm. but that was a special period. 150 years ago, there was no concept called employment or unemployment, right? It's nobody was employed, nobody was unemployed. We were doing work. So I'm going to think about my village. A natural learning is that I was learning to drive the water buffalo. My father doesn't knock me out for six years. They, I'm teaching, this is a, the water buffalo model, this the diagram has two, <laughs> and oh, then we learn the different parts, you drive this thing, you recognize what food we eat. He puts me there, here's the water buffalo, go. <laughs> I take it out, I have to feed the water. That's natural learning, you have a purpose. And today our children can do that with technology, with online, they can do that. I can think of a first grader, studying English. We, ha we have them write about my father, my mother, we do iBooks. What if you have them create an iBook for kids in China who wants to learn English? That would be much more natural, much more interesting yeah. than trying to teach about this and now this is a verb. So I think this authenticity serve a purpose, not just we try to say, okay, in case you might need this in the future, memorize this. Right. That, that's what we do now. And that's, but it's, it's silly. It's, nobody cares. It's really just... It's and there's a lot more to memorize now. Any of you who have children and you see what they're learning and the amount of vocabulary in the text, it has increased. And we have a national, design, national prescription for what to memorize called the mm -hmm. Common Core now. It's even better. The whole country will memorize the same thing in a few years. <laughs> That's going to be great. That makes us American. That's, that's it. That's right. <laughs> okay, well, if, if, if we want to move away from that, how do we get there? How do we activate these, these skills, this natural learning mm -hmm. that all of us have? What's, what's a path there? Well, one of the paths that we went after was to try to support <coughs> informal learning. And we wanted to do this both for teachers and for students because teachers love to learn. That's why they're teachers, right? They're continually learning. And to, I know many after school programs also try to work on student choice. But informal learning is what you used to do when you walked five miles to school or you hung out in the afternoon. And now that free time is very compressed. Almost half of our uh, kids are bused to school. And 20% of our population spends like six and eight hours in school buildings, and then they're bused home again. And so you have this huge um, void of free time which to explore. And then when you do, we now do have the internet. And the internet is an incredibly powerful tool. And in fact, so powerful that sometimes it makes more interesting stuff than sitting in the school listening to a teacher. So education has to balance and understand this onslaught of technology and to celebrate it and use it appropriately and balance it with those outdoor activities. Well, I think the, the, we know what's right. Children, the, the psychologists and today we talk, children needs free play, mm -hmm. children needs to interact with nature, children yes. needs to do all those right things. But I think the problem right now, we got to start, when you can start working with teachers, when I look around, I think the first thing you should do, you should get Arne Duncan back to Chicago. <laughs> and uh, the, the, the reason I say that, because I think uh, we have the national policymakers are driving a different standard. Mm -hmm. So I think what's most dangerous to this country today is we have the wrong, 
goal to pursue. We think that test scores something we should pursue. Hmm. We have this uh, manufactured crisis of education we're losing uh, to other Asian countries. So this is like, um, we're pursuing the wrong goal. Think about the Easter Island and those giant stone heads. Those stone heads caused the demise of this great civilization. And they were not, you know, they were based on, they were, today, our schools are under siege by those false gods who want test scores. So therefore, we want to curriculum, we want to homogenize our children. Therefore, we believe, for example, our theaters, our art galleries are useless because they do not help children learn to score better. So unless we change the score as a standard, we'll never be able to improve. Parents are actually hijacked by the same concept. The test scores mean something. They actually don't mean much. You know, right now you probably read in the media. You, you guys deal with the media a lot. So they, they talk about Americans, we spend so much money per student, $10,000, sometimes New York, $20,000 per student. We don't score as well as Vietnam, as Estonia, as Macau. And so of course, you know, it's different because test scores are, do not worth much. You guys all went to college. Some of you, at least, I hope. And, uh, and you, you, you went there. You remember the time you bought three daughters bottles of wines? Three daughters? Just three bottles? I mean, somewhere you went to. Today, you probably can't afford $30 bottle of wines now. If you measure how fast you get drunk, is there much difference? <laughs> the $3, the $30? You look better, though, with else. that $30 bottle of wine <laughs> on your table. You really America's do. America's $10,000 education includes field trips, includes art experiences. That's how we can produce a lot more. St produce. I've always said we, have, we are wasting America's best possibilities. Education is broadly defined. Mm -hmm. Now we're trying to narrow the definition. That's right. And, and uh, I'm, I'm sorry about that because I want to speak one point. Mm -hmm. and lack of those opportunities can hurt mm -hmm. a lot of people. I always thought I could have become a Justin Bieber. But now I'm sitting <laughs> here. Uh, but I had no access to music. He hasn't had a hit for a while. I think no, it's okay. I had no <laughs> access to music uh, until college. So I could not have become one. So you one. did not have those resources No, I school. could have. Uh, if I had YouTube, I would become one. Well, I want to give you an opportunity because you wanted to respond. But let's talk about well, resources. Well, it's the... Assessments and assessment leading education really takes the adventure out of learning. And that's really what education is about. When you're not excited about getting the A, right? You're excited because you have this aha moment because you really found something that interested you and you want to know more. And we have people talking about that, but until we allow teachers to teach that way and to encourage that in their classroom and not be driven to deliver the goods in a certain way and then have it tested at the other end, we are really killing the adventure in learning. And then we have these 12 years and you're out if you don't go to college, right? And so you're maybe stullified and you're not interested really in learning and you're despondent because you didn't become a thing an artist or a scholar or a jock. And so the whole system is really kind of disastrous. <laughs> right, <laughs> so let's pull back from the disaster and think about what this alternative model would look like and how we begin to implement it. Um, one of the things, I mean, you invoked Arne Duncan and that he should come back to Chicago, but many of those ideas about reforming education, he did develop here in Chicago, and then he took them to the national level. You know, they kind of underwrite these, these ideas that are driving, as you say, school curriculum across mm -hmm. the country. So how do we, I mean, where do we start dismantling that system, if that's what you're both advocating? Mm -hmm. and, and how do we do that? Do we start in like local, is it one school experimenting? What, what, what are some ideas for how you get these ideas? Mm -hmm. Because they are radical, at least in, in comparison to the way we're doing education now. Um, so how do we start moving toward them? Well, I think, you know, we, we have to, number one, we have to stop something because it is right now, the national policy, it is actually driving teachers and schools 
And uh, you know, we're reducing the autonomy of teachers. People have to comply. That's why I need. I think you know, since 1983, a nation at risk. We've been trying to do this. The only thing I found America, you know, in the in the Republicans and Democrats agree on is how to screw up screw up public education. That's why the only thing they agree on is just, that's how basically they're doing this. In Arnie Duncan, you know, or actually Obama and Bush, a new different in public uh, in education policy. May uh, let me approach different angles but they are trying to homogenize the production. So we have to stop that. Then, however, I look at many schools, you know, in CPS schools, a lot of suburb schools, uh, they, there are brave schools. Every school, you can, you can start somewhere, or every teacher can start somewhere. The change can happen. And you know, I would argue for three simple things. Personalized learning. Mm -hmm. Education should be support every child's strength, mm -hmm. not fix their deficit. If you start from somewhere, that's something. <laughs> Number two, product-driven and product-oriented. Number three, globalized context. Today, with technology, you <laughs> don't have to teach your children with the confinements of a classroom. It should right. be completely student-driven. And student-driven, John Dewey started from Chicago, too. Remember John Dewey? Mm -hmm. That was a dream. That was something nice to do. No many Oregonians would do it. But now, I think, today, child-centered education is an economical necessity is not something nice to do. You have a similar idea, Linda. You talk at, well, you invoked it, the aha moment, and that's mm -hmm. a moment that everyone has to arrive at. So this notion of education as student-driven is very powerful across your two models. So how would you start, how do you start implementing that into what's really a regimented um, classroom where the opportunity for that recognition isn't really the point. It, move, it goes from moving the teacher as the director of the classroom to the teacher as a facilitator with the student, lifelong learning with the student. Like the teacher's actually learning something new with the students and mm -hmm. together they are working on something then that is new even for their community that goes out of the school classroom onto the school grounds into the school community. And I believe it begins with, the, though there's policy, and there's school districts, and there's teachers, and there's students. It takes a very, and principals, it takes very strong leaders in schools to choreograph an incredibly talented teaching team and get the best out of each teacher, and to allow those teachers to reach individual <laughs> learning types to allow the school to provide support. So they're not just delivering this in that 50 minute chunk and this in that 50 minute chunk, but they're actually developing the whole child and they're really getting the child to feel confident with who they are and what they want to contribute to the world. I mean, they need to go back to what education is. Education is not a test score. The purpose of education is to support our children in delivering and finding a purpose in life. Okay, how do you personalize education when you're a teacher in a class with, say, 30 students? I mean, that sounds daunting to me. It's actually personalization. I would um, change everything, is that, uh, you know, when we talk about today, there's so many, so many policies focus on fixing the teacher. I think that's fix the student, fix the student. A, a good student should be able to survive any bad teacher. Well, right? good, good I, I think as good students should survive. I, I think it's they do. It's we go to college. We, you know, we all have bad teachers. We somehow survived. Yeah. You, they're empowered. So I think in in, in a personalized learning, the personalization is not done by the teacher. It's you enable the students the freedom to mm -hmm. access. Exactly. A teacher is just one of the resources. I could come to the theater. I can get online. And I think we should change that mentality. Now we blame teachers. By the way, I like, love the slogan, teacher is the most important you know, element of education in a classroom. You think that's a compliment? No, it's responsibility. They're scary. If these kids feel it's your problem, they say, no, it's not. I'm not the most important person in my classroom at all. It's the students. But so th what I think we can do is that we have to recognize today children, their resource they can learn is truly available almost everywhere. So you let them personalize. It's, a, it's like democracy. You know, there's two democracies. One is what we call the managed democracy. You know, the king will decide how you're going to enjoy democracy. That's called teacher-driven personalization. Or it's the students decide how we're going to run this whole thing. So I think we, we have failed to acknowledge the arrival of a new age of information, of mentors. I mean, your student from anywhere can be talking to Linda. 
I actually work with students from different countries. They actually email me, hey, I'm supposed to interview this. Students can do this. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to shift this idea about classroom based. It's more individual student driven. Teachers become consultants to students. Mm -hmm. And I also would like to bring up the design model because design um, at the college level is a culture. And the students actually learn more from each other than they do from any of the instructors because those dynamics are set into place. So in other words, they're actually working on things that they don't know about. They're investigating things, researching, modeling things, testing them together. So the teacher doesn't know the answer and the teacher and the students are looking at all these alternative ways. And so there's that critical thinking where they can begin to reflect because eventually one or two ideas will come out that are better and more superior. So innovation and entrepreneurial is not just, oh, I have an idea. We all have great ideas almost all during the day. It's the perseverance and the drive to test it, to um, have it judged by others, and to actually get it the distance to get it out there. That's an incredible drive to inculcate in a student. And just finishing this set of information and taking this test is not building that impetus. I have to say, when I read the, the description or some of your case studies of product-oriented learning, mm -hmm. Young and I, it made me think of The Apprentice, the television show <laughs> with Donald Trump. I mean, is that an inspiration for you? Are you really thinking about students being these young, okay, let's start a business. Mm -hmm. And so here's the concept and here, you know, like going mm -hmm. through that whole process of trying to sell it, to creating a team, to, do, you know, is, yeah, yeah, the Apprentice. I, actually, I don't think I watched it, but it's, it's, it's it should be a, <laughs> it should be a good good uh, good model. What really, uh, and one of the source of my inspiration actually came from Kim Kardashian. So, so, uh, <laughs> I actually met her once. Did she, you? I know I don't know if she met me, but I met her. But it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, though it's actually a real story. I was in, I was in Australia in uh, Melbourne. I was uh, we were in the same hotel, and uh, I was get right in the elevator, and she walked in with a bunch of people. Said, "Please give way. Kim is here." I said, "Okay, fine. Kim is here." So. Uh, and apparently I, was, I had to get out of the elevator, I was not unhappy. Then I saw all these people waiting there. So uh, I, I got very interested. I said, who is this person? I talked to my daughter and uh, she's, she's young, she's 15. So she knows everything about pop stars and she, she's my, <laughs> my, my pop culture consultant. I asked her, I said, who is this Kim? She said, it must be Kim Kardashian. I said, well, uh, wh what's, uh, why people are waiting for her? She said, well, my daughter says she's a celebrity. I said, celebrity for what? She said, nothing. <laughs> and I said, that nothingness, Alison, inspired me. Today, you can be out of your parents' basement for nothing. <laughs> and that, they, that's where I talk about the rise of undervalued talents. But in our schools, there's no textbook to drive them. So I would like to say, can we have projects that can really showcase the value of undervalued talents in schools? Like, uh, I mean, you may not like Kadarshan at all, but she is out of her parents' basement. That, that's the basic argument. Is that, so, so I the, think she built her parents' basement. I don't know. I, maybe. <laughs> so the idea is, I think what I'm very interested in is that are you, every, on a daily basis, as a school, as a class, creating events and moments mm -hmm. for children to feel good about themselves? Creativity is joy itself. You know how creative? When people are deprived of possibility to create, they become destructive. You know, that they, and they become depressed. Mm -hmm. It's very hard. So, so are you creating that moment? Every teacher, parent, do you allow them to even have a chance to express that they can be creative? I want to talk about your website, because it's kind of a fascinating model for this, Linda, next.cc. Mm -hmm. Can you walk us through sort of how that works to kind of unleash this creativity, this mm -hmm. maybe nothingness that we <laughs> could excel at in the future? Yes, I'm trying to think of someone famous that I saw to tell a story about. For nothing. But <laughs> <Maybe> nothing. <laughs> Um, the CC stands for curiosity and compassion, and those are two integral characteristics that I think that we think that children need to have as they go out into the world to kind of equip them on both sides to be resilient, that they need to always keep learning and that they need to understand that they're learning and whatever they do is part of the bigger picture, which is a global picture. But it started, uh, it's actually a collaboration between um, college art 
education designers and architecture students and K-12 teachers and administrators. And it basically brings current issues that kids in college are researching and passionate about, things that they think will change the world, and it creates journeys, like that adventure of learning, with activities, and the activities take whoever is using the website from the computer into their uh, school community, their home, to make them more aware of what's going on around them and get them connected. And then it also um, encourages projects in their own community and then projects with global understandings. So what it does is it takes discrete um, assessment-based learning and it starts pulling it like this across nine connected scales. I thought of your products, but it goes from nanotechnology to pattern, object, space, architecture, neighborhood, region, and the world, and global. Because anything we do as humans, anything we do and produce into the world has effects around either of those scales. And when you go through an activity, you just click on it and go into it, it has um, links to the rest of the world to virtual field trips, to heritage sites, to the Louvre, to the archaeological museum. And it has contemporary art, sciences, and design practices as opportunities or role models. So if you're doing math and all of a sudden you see that a scientist is using math to calculate distance between stars, or if you're folding origami and then all of a sudden you go into paper engineering and you see Shigeru Ban is making buildings out of paper, and then Japan is sending a um, ship into space that's made out of paper, you begin to see that, oh, what I am learning in school can actually be a livelihood, and I can actually like what I'm doing and make a living at it. So it really is very easy, it's very fluid, it's everything, it's make, taking advantage of what's online. TED Talks, Khan Academy, patterns in math, patterns in cities, patterns in the skin of your hand. And this is the possibility for that personalized learning you were mm -hmm. talking about earlier? And teachers use it um, actually to get ideas, and students use it uh, in homeroom to develop their own projects. They might finish something but express interest in it, and then they can look at that, and at the end of each is this relate where you then have 20 or 30 other journeys. So you're learning, they understand that learning isn't done with that test, that's done, but it actually is all connected. How do we measure the success, whether these kinds of project or product-based or project-based learning work? Like, I think for one, we, we, I understand what you're saying, that testing both sort of is, is symptomatic of and is driving mm -hmm. the crisis of education, but I think for some parents, testing is a way, here, I know where my child is, and I know how they compare to other children. That's the promise, right? That you have some way of measuring their progress. Mm -hmm. So in your systems, does testing play any role? How do you assess mm -hmm. outcomes? Uh, I think you know, there's always kind of assessment, because right now, they, uh, yes. I just go back to the, the testing a little bit, is that I think, uh, I, I hope you're thinking this as parents and grandparents too, is that uh, uh, most of the testing have nothing to do with what your kids would be able to do in the future. <laughs> They're basically uh, uh, capturing how well they can find answer to other people's questions, judged by others. That's employee, hmm. you know. That's, uh, and uh, most of them is measuring uh, a very narrow set of uh, skills. It's cognitive skills in three subjects, mostly two, you know, reading <laughs> and, uh, and math. And they have uh, not necessarily what to do with passion, interest. Now there's more research showing the non-cognitive skills, non-cognitive like, uh, resilience, aspiration, mm -hmm. curiosity, creativity, independent thinking, collaboration, social networking are much more important hmm. in a person's life. You know, it's a, well, which is understandable in a new life, right? I mean, on the assembly line, I don't care if you are resilient, just push this part to the next guy. That's, but now yeah. those jobs are gone, so it's different. So I think I wouldn't measure, I wouldn't measure, I would actually look at schools, uh, do they engage my kids? You know, we're talking about this. Milton Chen actually was the person uh, yeah. from George Lucas Education Foundation. He said, a good measure of, uh, of your kids is that uh, do they walk into the school as uh, faster than they uh, leave in the school? <laughs> that's a good measure. You know, yes. if they're eager to go to some place, that's a mm -hmm. pretty good measure. I, I would measure. My, plus, you know, if you should never try to compare your children 
with other people's children. That's homogenizing. Mm -hmm. Everybody should be uniquely different. You know, if we want to be just like the other one, it's no interest. Like someone said, there's always space at the top. But who's top? How do you get there? So that's, I, I would have a very different way of measuring things. And I did want to point out that in your book, I was really pleased to read um, that you were differentiating between three different types of project-based learning. Thank and you. that is the same thing that we have found, that there are project-based um, projects in school, which will give the student choice. You may write a paper, you can make a poster, you can make a Prezi. Well, that's just a project in school. That's really not project-based learning. And then there is project-based learning where every student gets to do a project for every assignment. I also don't think that that's truly project-based learning because you have someone designing a corral for horses and somebody designing solar panels for the moon and they're not learning really from each other because there aren't two people designing solar panels for the moon. So that's where the design studio culture comes in that at least in the beginning, they do some of the same type of design work together so they open up that dialogue so that I can go over and say, Young, mm -hmm. you could do this on that project, all right? And then he mm -hmm. would feel comfortable to say, Linda, you know, I like this, but this, did you think about this? So you open up that collaborative spirit. And this is done really well when students collaborate on films and collaborate on um, making presentations. But then the true point, which you go into, is where they actually take it out of the school then. It's not just a class project or a project for a grade, but it's a project that is meaningful in world is to world community, local, or global issues today. And it's transformative. You know, one thing about collaboration, I just add to Linda's point. In our schools, we think collaboration, true collaboration is considered cheating. Do you know that? It's, oh, right. a, it's like cheating. <laughs> You know, for example, you know, I'm bad at drawing, which I am, but I'm good at writing. If I'm to draw, doing a that's cheating. It's kind of right. You see what I mean? But that's true collaboration. So most of our project-based learning, we have people do the same thing. That's another big, uh, I think, mental shift we all have to make. Now in our education, we still believe mm -hmm. children need to learn the same thing the same time, the same level, that's why we have those assessment. We still need to look at children and say, you gotta master all of this. 5,000 years ago, it's okay, you can know everything. But today, it's very hard for you to know everything. It's, it's you know, you, you can't cannot. beat Wikipedia. Even Wikipedia cannot <laughs> do know everything yet, you know, just. Uh, so that's, I think, something we need to withdraw mm -hmm. to say, that's why I call strength-based. We kept fixing people's deficit without recognizing that deficit itself in another context might be great strength. Dyslexia is a great example for that. Mm -hmm. And I think that I wouldn't also get rid of tests completely because testing is a form, but to champion over every other type of assessment is, is not right. Would you get rid of schools? I mean, I, I kind of was struck by... <laughs> I don't know how else to ask it. It's maybe a rude question, but I, I, I do feel like, I mean, some of the, I, the models that you pointed to, um, I'm blanking on the name, but the school in the UK, where it, it basically is following the unschooling principle. It is a school, but mm -hmm. anything that, it doesn't look anything like what we would understand a school. What would it call schools like, I would call learning environments. Learning they don't environments. have to be schools like this. You know, people, are, uh, my really advocacy is that people, children learn or ourselves mm -hmm. creating their own personalized learning ecosystem. You know, and, and we all schools as they are right now are actually being challenged. Many universities are challenged by MOOCs, open mm -hmm. courses, and if we still teachers think we're in the information transmission business, we will be out of business because, uh, so I'm actually uh, uh, suggesting <laughs> schools can exist, mostly exist for social, emotional reasons and motivational reasons. Uh, university asked me to advise, what are we gonna do when we have to take, everybody can take a free course from MIT. I said, well, <laughs> build more bars. They are good, you know, it's a social space. You know, so we still need this human social yes. and motivation. So schools change its role, not as information provider, but as social organizing space. So, mm -hmm. and then all our teachers have to change. You know, today we, I, I pose this fake question when you can Google everything, why do you need that teacher? I said, well, we need that teacher to give the children a reason to Google. 
Right? So that, that's what we call motivational, social, and supportive. It's, mm -hmm. That's the, how, how it changes the whole definition of teaching. One of our inspirations was the Yellow Pages by an architect by the name of Richard Saul Worman, who actually founded TED. And it basically said, you don't need schools, you just need your community. Mm -hmm. That literally, and in fact, they do say that entrepreneurialism is often very place-specific and place-based. And so you have that short time, uh, particularly before pubescent and adolescence, um, where you can really show your town or your neighborhood and engage it in all types of projects so that your chi the children really feel part of belonging someplace. Even if it's in a city in Chicago, there's so much here. And once they get into that, they begin to see the world as their place for learning. So when they're done with their high school testing, they will go out and look for places to learn in the world. So that was the idea of no school building. Mm -hmm. But schools still are actually really inspirational places. We drove some by schools. some schools. <laughs> yeah, some schools. You can feel their character as you open the doors. And you can see them and know that many ideas have been shared. I mean, Plato went under the tree, right? You can go in a classroom with desks. You can make magic happen there. It doesn't have to be absolutely the brand new spitting image. It's how you organize time spent together. I call it the choreography of the classroom. You know, honestly, when I look at Chicago, I can't comprehend why, what did the children do to deserve to be sentenced to those boring <laughs> classrooms in a school? What did yeah. they do? I mean, you have yeah. all so many exciting museums, the streets, the yeah. galleries, oh. and the movie theaters, and just watching people down, you know, the, 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 the Michigan Avenue, watching the beaches by the lake. But now we sentence all our children to, sit. to a white, <laughs> boring classroom, teach them something, they have no interest, they don't care, I might have no use, and we force them to tell us if you have consumed that whole thing, you know, just to have them vomit back. It's just, it's, it's actually, I'm really shocked by, by how we do that. Chicago is the, the most interesting learning, edu most interesting school the city is. Hmm. But now we put kids over there and we test them and we punish the teachers for, for not, it's just really <laughs> just sad for me to say that. And then the poorer you are, the worse your condition is. Yes. We're sending more yeah. kids to the more boring places. It's I did want to ask you about that before we open it up for questions, which was about equity. Because I think you know we can see that there are a lot of schools in Chicago that are experimenting, that are trying mm -hmm. to innovate. You know, and that's the whole idea behind our charter system, for example, that right. these could be places that experiment and innovate mm -hmm. and come up with alternatives to the system as we know it, which mm -hmm. isn't producing the results that we want. But there does seem to be a question of whether even those small experiments get to the students who need it the most. The students who are poor, who are coming mm -hmm. in, you know, like the disadvantages are so incredible that they are mm -hmm. having to face that aren't solely educational, right? So can you talk about the, that? I think the, uh, the way we treat poverty in this country is, is uh, in education. I, I think one thing is, of course, this group is trying to deny it. They think, you know, Poverty has no impact on kids. It's all teachers' fault. Remember, that's one, one school of thinking. The other thing, when they even try to fix it, I think it's because of the measurement of what, what's called good education. No Child Left Behind has deprived a, a lot more children, poor children's opportunity to be exposed to something else. We just uh, wrote a book called um, The Achievement Gap Versus the Opportunity Gap. Trying to close the achievement gap has widened the opportunity gap. Widen the opportunity gap in what matters? Because we want children to meet the AYP, to pass the you know math and language arts, and uh, I think a lot of the federal government, even even I think your only Arnie Duncan says, unless you can do math, you cannot play basketball. Uh, do you say why that, that's a, unless you can finish reading, you cannot yes. do this? Well, d if you did that to Michael Phelps, a great swimmer. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he, wouldn't, he was not good reading, he was ADHD, he would be still hooked on phonics in some basement, not <laughs> swimming. You think, about, it's, it's, think about all this, this idea. So what I think yeah. in the way we teach poverty, I'm from a very poor village, very, my, all my, my family were illiterate, basically. It's, uh, I think I got out of the whole thing 
because I was not confined to basal readers, I was able to do whatever I was able to do, kind of, you know. So nobody, I mean, after first grade, I was the smartest guy in the village. I did whatever I wanted to do. So in, luckily, my father let me be like that. So I defined something. Today, I think a lot of them are poor children. We deprive them of the dream. They come to school and tell you, you're bad. I tell you, so I won't help you to be good. Remember, I help you teaching you. Then we constantly measure them to make them feel bad. Nobody wants to hang out in a place that makes them feel bad. You know, th those no. things. And we don't recognize their talents. They actually have a lot of talents. And then we deprive them of opportunities. Some of them may be triggered by music, by art, by making a train, mm -hmm. go to the, you know, the, the science museum. But they were never given the chance. So if they can't read, we'll give them more reading. You know, and uh, <laughs> if they're tired of it, we'll get them even more tired of it. So that, that's what we are doing. The tutoring lessons, all those things. So th I think we're addressing the poverty in a very wrong way. We, we do not recognize poverty does not kill hope. You know, no matter how poor children are, they have hope. We have to go with their hope and support that. Instead of trying to impose our hope on the poor children's hope and measure, oh, you're not hoping for the same things I do. We gotta work from there. Thank you. Okay, let's take some questions. Um, Allison started, I did ask, and I want to hear more, uh, one question about getting from here to there. And um, I've been trying to contribute to that. And I've uh, did a TEDx day back in September, and I've got a website and so forth. And, but I noticed that even Ken Robinson, he gets three million hits for his talks, but I don't see the people in power listening. And I feel like they have designed a system that's very effective at making everybody comply. So I would like to hear from, this, from the design people about how we can design activities and efforts that begin to make these changes because I just, I, I feel so frustrated about how to get from here to there. Yeah. Well, I come from a very uh, large international, global, and more policy level. Uh, I, I look as an immigrant, I, I found this country is in danger, this country. Mm. I think we have a movement toward trusting more authoritarianism. We, I think this country from, uh, like Thomas Friedman said, can't we be China for a day, you know, for example. He can have it for a year, but it's... Uh, <laughs> uh, the, the, I think we have begun to uh, 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 admire countries that can produce efficiency. Because our country is so inefficient, we began to question democracy. Our schools the same way, so we have a general movement to admire countries. Today, all international tests, like Teams, PISA, they measure nothing else but homogenization. The test scores, that basically shows how well a system can homogenize kids. That, that's it, that's, that's the test, no matter what they claim to be. That's why you look at the top 10 countries, right. eight of them are, are Confucian countries. Let's let Linda that's, come in here. Yeah. I, I think we're in actually a wonderful time as, as hard pressed as teachers are because there is an explosion of learning potential. There also is an explosion of grassroots efforts that are actually changing the way we rethink, reimagine, and re-relate things. And it's not necessarily going to start top down. So I think we have to work in our own communities and we have to make change at a scale that we can actually impact. And if it has to swag the dog of policy, then we're going to have to bring in international research, which you have done a good job at, but it shows, the Grattan inst uh, report Grattan, that I was speaking yeah, of today, shows that Shanghai teachers teach classes of 40, but they only are in front of students teaching 12 hours a week, which is very much like a university professor schedule, whereas in this country, K-12 teachers are in front of students 30 hours a week with little 12-minute moments to figure out this. Well, that's really clear to me that there has, if they're echoing that these people are doing better at their standards, then can't we relieve how we're doing this as well? The second thing is teacher education. I think that can really be transformed and supported in 
brand new ways that can really help them bring in these other creative aspects while delivering the common core. I guess though, I guess I, mean, I want to push on that question a mm -hmm. little bit for you. Um, you know, because I mean, I was talking earlier this week, this story of a teacher who was trying to do a project which would involve students coming up to the blackboard and interacting mm -hmm. with words and the whole class was engaged in this and was asked to not do that because students needed to stay in their seats. So it seems to me that you're dealing with, like, in okay. some cases, not across the board, but you're dealing with very kind of confined, and that's what I heard in that question, like confined sort of space or autonomy in which you can make change. Well, so the, what could you do in that system to kind of move toward your system? Well, the, the reason, you know, I was actually citing those, uh, the, those uh, uh, social issues is that we have to, first of all, return to the old America when the damage was done. That is more local autonomy, mm -hmm. more local schools, smaller, 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 because the larger bureaucracy have the pursuit. So policy-wise, we really have to break up. Now we are moving to more national, but we need to do more local, mm -hmm. more teacher professional, uh, more teacher professional autonomy. That's where I was trying to get, but the, another big issue policy-wise, I think, I think changing teachers, changing parents, fixing teachers take too long. Do you, do you know how, how hard, you know, based on the international recommendation like McKinsey, you start by making the teaching profession more interesting, more attractive. You, you change the whole thing, it takes like whole three generations to fix teachers. Fixing students, changing students is great. So right now, I would really talk a lot, I've spent a lot of time to empower students mm -hmm. to redefine their own learning systems. We spend no money on that at all. Do you know right now in schools we spend, so, so I would say very small schools, empower a lot more parents, and creating a lot more out-of-school opportunities. And maybe WBEZ can run its own school, for example. Why not? Yeah, listen, you look like a good teacher. You can run it. Just take <laughs> me around. It's a, I think no it's a, that's what I would start. I would really, I would really do very local, smaller school, schools, independent, autonomous mm -hmm. school systems, not as big ones. I think that's going to be very important. I see a question right here. Concern. Uh, I'm very much like you, Dr. Haas. I'm from a rural, southern community, poor, very hard time. But somehow I ended up very, in my estimation, creative. But the children that I teach, or that I've taught for the past 30 or 40 years, it's very hard to get them to be creative. We've done something in America that's kind of blocked that in, in, the, in the whole picture. What do you do? to uh, get children to see, to become creative. Because they want to sit in that little box too, you know. The they want to just zone. stay there and pass the test and do the things. And so it's very hard for you to get them, say if you have 30 children, to just do what they want. I was, right. when you were saying about uh, let them all have freedom, I mm -hmm. thought about 40,000 uh, children in, in Chicago just say, okay, you can go do what you want to do today. <laughs> you know, it would be, the, it'd be the, they don't know how to handle the creativity. How do you teach that? How do you work well, with that? Well, I think you have to catch them having fun. And there isn't one ticket to that. Actually, there's a lot of games. There are old card games that all of a sudden they catch themselves. There are picture games where they can pick them and talk about them. They can build things and learn from it. But you have to catch them having fun because fun is the pathway to creativity. It's a pleasurable. Don't they have to have a responsibility to it? Um, I don't think so. I think you open it up. I think that creativity is nurtured. I think at the college level, at the School of the Art Institute, they have to come to it with something. They're older. But when they're young and they haven't been exposed to it or haven't had the opportunity, all right, then they have to be encouraged. They have to be supported in finding that pleasure moment. It's well, like if you had to get endomorphines from exercising, right? like you have to do sit-ups or something, well, that's not feeling very good, so I'm not having fun. But finally, you do something, you run or something, and you get the endomorphines and you feel good. Creativity, is, is everybody is born with the capacity <laughs> to be creative. So creativity in terms of our cognitive skills, we are all creative. You cannot even kill it. Yeah. What we learn not to become creative is right. a social reaction. So you know, right. even like you know, uh, mm -hmm. we, we what happens, however, is this: creativity is useless unless they're disciplined. 
and Can with ethical it. responsibilities. Mm -hmm. You know, we all have this genius of creativity. They're like raindrops. They're useless <laughs> unless you are confined by riverbanks. Then they form well, a river focused. of force. You become so that's focused. where you, you have to. And then, but that imposes limitation that riverbanks has to be invited, not imposed upon. So for children, for example, we discipline them through the process. So you are creating something. Just everybody can have a great idea for the moment. But can you turn that into something that's sustained and disciplined to be of value to others? That's the key. So, but we, we don't do that. Right now, I think we, we prepare kids to be creative. By the time we, we do that, actually, we kill their creativity. When you get 40,000 kids, 100,000 kids, they can all be creative. But there's one thing that binds us, our local context. You know, you 40,000 people, if you're in this, on this, living on this one street, this, the, the, the houses, the, the uh, climate, the ch they confine what you can be creative. Creativity doesn't mean you, know, you can come up with crazy ideas. Not many people mm -hmm. can. Even dreams are kind of logical sometimes. It's, uh, so it's, uh, so I, I think you're, you are automatically confined. What do you do as teachers? We create an environment. We encourage certain types of creativity. We discourage something else. That's why you, know, you go to music school. People are musically creative. Over there, you could be creative engineering, but that's not very much valued. Do you see what I'm saying? That's those environments confines what we can be creative about. I mean, in my village, it would be very hard to invent an iPad. We had no electricity, and the bamboo doesn't work for iPads. So you can, but yeah. people would be creative in about how to drive the water buffalo. So that's how we actually confined. But I think I actually like your question very much because there is a culture of creativity that allows all ideas to be openly shared. And that we need as a country. Yang's idea can't be necessarily better than your ideas until it's Not laid really. on the table and everyone can, sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's very hard to generate in a group of people because there's always ownership and there's hierarchy. And yet this race, the human race, deserves this time because we need to learn from each other in a way we haven't had before and we have access to that. So we have to have diverse approaches on the table and we have to be open and generous about them and we have to have confidence to put them out there. I think we have another question here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank the panel a lot and uh, it's, it's been very stimulating discussion. My name is Marvin Bartell. I'm an uh, art educator from Goshen College in Indiana. And I have a website since I've retired. I've spent a lot of time for, it's a website for art teachers and I get a lot of questions right now from art teachers who are beginning to be asked by their administrators to to tell their principals, how do we evaluate you? What are your student learning objectives that you are teaching? And these art teachers are telling me, or asking me, to give them uh, reasonable learning objectives that they should be teaching, that they can live with mm -hmm. themselves as well. Mm -hmm. And having read my my webpage on creativity killers in the art room, uh, they understand that what I will give them is not what they've been taught as art teachers to teach. I'm not going to tell them you have to teach the design principles, for example, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, what I will tell them is that assessment is important and it's an important thing in the same way that motivation is important. And we know that in motivation, it's really intrinsic motivation that's important. And that's what Daniel Pink is talking about in his book on Drive. He's talking about what motivates us. And in studio art, those of us who are artists, we know that we are continually, moment by moment, doing intrinsic motivation as we make choices in the design of our work. Mm -hmm. So you're asking the question, how does design enter into all of this as a, as a force, as a, as, as a way of knowing what student learning objectives are? We are in the position to design 
intrinsic motivation because that's what art is. Mm -hmm. That's what design is. We don't, we don't create anything without thinking about, oh, how is this working? Mm -hmm. As soon as we make a choice, we say, oh, maybe I should have made a different choice here, or maybe I should have tried this, maybe I should, and so on. We are continually assessing, and it's not assessment that's brought down upon us from above, but we are, in, we are actually teaching assessment instead of being assessed. Does, uh, can I, uh, so I, I don't know if you have a question, but I was going to ask based on what you're saying. If well, my question is, why do we ask teachers to articulate uh, student learning objectives that are going to be mm -hmm. in, uh, brought down on them from above? Right. Why don't we ask teachers to teach assessment yeah. from... Mm -hmm. From that, the ground. That actually is what is happening in other countries. Versus extrinsic, extrinsic. Okay. assessment. And actually teachers are um, creating their own assessments. This is a project that they're putting together, particularly when it's outside of that realm. So they're doing design projects or art projects and they are declaring this is what we think we are assessing. And so we need that empowerment for our teachers. Yeah, I was going to ask just because it was interesting what you were saying, whether there's a, a room for student, like in this whole product-oriented learning, if students do the assessment, I As mean, well. if that's part of how you do the measurement of a success or, you know, what, mm -hmm. what happened throughout the course of designing or developing a product. Yeah, I, I think as, you have to, as long as you're making progress, for example, if, you, if students are writing art in a work, it's a, you can't have the first perfect painting. You interact with people <laughs> and people, you will improve those things. And, but there's no true creative uh, final thing. There's no final really uh, assessment rubric to say. You know, it's, uh, once you can apply some rubric, that's not true, truly creative. We try to do it. It's, uh, so I think the, another big problem right now today is we think when, when you reduce something into a number, it suddenly becomes scientific. <laughs> Do you notice that? You know, we like to reduce numbers. Oh, he is 89. He's a moron. You know, he's under 75. He's a genius. It, it, those are really silly things. We just reduce them. And so that's the, the, the desire. But however, you raise another very important policy issue. Why, do an art teach, why does an art teacher have to respond to the leader about that? That's where the danger comes in. If when your children go to school, and they, they're trying to reduce their whole life experience into this Russian educational you know, uh, uh, curriculum and have to be forced to measure by someone dictated. I mean, in Illinois, I mean, it will be Springfield dictating what, how the measure should be done. That's, really the, that's the danger of it. So teachers have to respond mm -hmm. to those bureaucratic mandates. And people say, you have to assess someone. I said, why do I have to assess? Interesting question. <laughs> right. Let's get another question here. See over here. Um, I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on the role of failure in innovation and in design, especially mm -hmm. in an academic setting and in a product-oriented learning. It's, it's absolutely essential, and this is part of putting A's or perfect answers on test scores as the ultimate goal of education, because children who do that don't have that protected time. K-12 is a protected time before they get out of their parents' basement, and they need to be able to fail because life is about that resiliency of what do we do. So they need to understand that the world is not always the perfect answer for very few people that ever happen, for no one that really happens. And so design is about testing ideas. Now we've even tried to go through the STEAM approach because engineering, in some ways, the language talks about ideas. It's understanding forces in the world and testing them and then learning from them. But we need those opportunities to be very regular across disciplines and across subjects in schools. Freedom is essential because Finner does help number one to know what you're not good at. Being able to run away from what you're not good at is key. It's, it's very important, seriously. I'm, I, I'm speaking English. I majored in English because I was bad at math. I mean, Chinese can be bad at math. Just believe me, it's, it's possible. It's, uh, now, the second thing is that you learn the failure is important. But the problem is that 
And most cultures, especially in education culture, we don't like failure. You know, you look at Chicago, the suburb school, I suppose suburb urban parents. I want my kids to be perfect in kindergarten before they're born to be perfect, <laughs> and then they'll be perfect all the way. We don't allow, and our policy do not allow that. Remember, like, any failure is bad. So the issue is that maybe can we say, okay, it's okay to be a, to be a failure until third grade. And that's actually what we do. We, we yeah, don't no, test actually, kids until fourth. Yeah. And then that's why we have this called, uh, uh, creativity called a fourth grade slump. Mm -hmm. Around the fourth grade, the majority of kids become less creative. Fourth mm -hmm. grade, because we become serious, no failure is allowed. So I think now no, we need become to become smart. We need to encourage <laughs> people to have uh, action to have more failure. But there is another thing: just, is this no hard evidence? But we know after 1990s, there is a creativity decline among children in the U.S. Young children, that like creativity and divergent thinking, that coincided with more responsible parenting. Do you know that? But so parents will suggest you should be watching TV with your kids, read books with your kids, and make sure go walk to them. You do everything with your kids. You know, it's a, it's a, and the kids are so tired of you. You still have to do everything with them. And what you are doing because you are planning for success. There's no free play. There's no exploration mm -hmm. anymore. The only place they can escape is uh, video games. And, and I, I, so actually, we have homogenous our children's learning environment. You should allow them to fail a lot. Mm -hmm. Let's go to a question over here. Um, thank you so much. I'm so inspired by so much you're saying, and it gives me so much hope in one way, and it makes me this close to homeschooling. I'm going to get booed <laughs> for saying that. I'm, I'm so frustrating. I, I, I'm a part of a, um, a coalition in a north suburb um, school where we're trying to really move for arts education in the core. Mm -hmm. And so much of what I heard you saying depends on collaboration, collaboration as a necessity. And you talked about the importance of strong leaders. And in our case, we have a principal who does not value the arts, who does not think or, or do anything collaboratively. Is Pardon she me? here? I didn't even look, but I hope she is. Okay. <laughs> Can we send her some reports? <laughs> um, and if she There's is, I invite her to really, I, I, I want to know how to help someone who is mm -hmm. not a collaborative thinker or doer, how to invite them into that partnership. And that's mm -hmm. also what I'm hearing so much of is the importance and the necessity of really being able to partner schools and communities because mm -hmm. we are all running out of money and I don't see us catching Getting up more. So what is, what is your feedback on that? Some schools make art clubs and then those art clubs actually do really proactive projects in the community, which raises the community's attention and interest. That's one way. They make environmental clubs because no one in the school is putting environmental education as a priority. And this is the 21st century and we have global issues. What are we teaching if we're not teaching about environmental issues? And so parents have been very proactive. But it will take people coming together and networking to get this whole country to realize that we can't cut budgets for education. It's our future. And we can't deny um, the creative industries connections to the economy if they want the economy to get better. We need our children to have those experiences. I think in your case, you think about the, generally we talk about 80-20 rule of innovation. Just. Uh, don't try to change 20% of something, not 80% of something. You may be able to bargain with the principal yeah. and say, hey, can I have you know, one day of a week hanging out <laughs> with the kids? Or can I have 20% of the kids to play with? Can I change 20% of the courses? Another mm -hmm. is with a lot of the, um, good I've seen a different struggles with school board members, teachers. We blame each other. Nobody likes each other. Everybody thinks <laughs> these other guys are doing the wrong thing. Only if they did this. I think a lot of times in this process, let's not assume evil in, uh, at in intention, but rather lack of capacity. So you might be more useful to go over to say, could I do this? You know, I don't need you to involve in anything, just could I do this? You know, or do you allow me to do this? There are evil people, but I hope there's not, yeah. not too many of them, but I don't think she's one of them. But you know, I haven't seen her. That, no, I think the idea is that you, we need to propose actionable items. A lot of people, because teachers are busy, principals are busy, make it actionable, and always ask the one question. Even if I, even if I failed miserably, what's the damage? If you can live with the mm. worst damage, then I should do it. You know, so that's how you, I think, always go to the bottom line. 
And I just urge you, childhood is a very short, fleeting gift. So give your children, equip them with as many opportunities to make those choices and to learn about their, their motivations and their interest. I think we have a question over here on the side. Thank you. Thank you, hi, good evening. Um, I'm excited that in Chicago, we are looking to invest in teachers and um, to empower students through educators and, and through systemic change, empowering the arts as part of um, every child's day. So I wonder, um, part of what we do at the Department of Educa Arts Education in CPS is to encourage teachers to be able to speak the language of the system and of the standards and mm -hmm. of the you know the the framework because mm -hmm. what I hear you saying and I appreciate is that sometimes the framework is oppressive and sometimes the standards are not um, exemplary mm -hmm. sure mm -hmm. but if we're really building a creative force shouldn't we as a creative force be able to speak Mm -hmm. every language right that's 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 coming at Absolutely. us and be fluent mm -hmm. in those standards and showing how then we as arts educators can empower students can show administrators with their very same systems yes how there is success in in classroom environments so i wonder how you all would speak to that idea of investing in mm -hmm. the system that does exist right i think it's always worth a try. I think that's the place in many times not, I know you had the authority um, dysfunction, the two of you, like the rebelling against authority in the beginning, but actually I think American for the Arts just put out a great report about children who take arts are four times more likely to succeed in high school and for, you know, more likely to get a job and go to college. So I think you can pull those things in. The second thing, all over this country and all over the world, there are cities coming together saying, what can we do to make our cities better? And they are beginning to look at the creative industries and creative culture as really a driver for the identity of the city and the economy. Milwaukee did one. I know Chicago had an array of things. Be out there, give your voice, be part of it. Cities need to understand that what's happening in those classrooms and schools is their future. It's key. I think, thank you. By mm -hmm. the way, thanks for the hard work you're doing because mm -hmm. now uh, it's sad we have to justify the value of arts because yeah. it helps learn math better. That's, that's, mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, that's, that's, that's what we do. Do you guys know what justifying the winner music because it helps you with the math. And we I, go to steam. I, I, the, the trouble, I, what I, I see is this. We have moved, this is only the last 20 years. Americans measurement of education has moved from input standards to output standards. Output like standards is very <laughs> dangerous. You are basically talking about, I can measure you, how well you are doing, and I assume somebody's going to develop the same way. I, th I would lo love to talk about input standards, because mm -hmm. input standards is about opportunities. Mm -hmm. For example, That's should every nice. school has art teacher? Should every school has art club? Mm -hmm. I think standards should be about opportunities, not gateways. Now our standards are becoming gateways. We used to select people to keep people out. You can do this, you cannot do that. And very little about opportunities. So uh, mm -hmm. I, I would uh, move a lot to say art or anything is about creating the opportunity, the support for our students, not trying to keep them in or out of certain domains. So that, that's what I think happens. The danger, especially in, in public schools right now, is that uh, we measure that so you have to produce this. Instead of trying to say you have to provide this. <laughs> that might be more interesting to think about as standards. Um, I really appreciate all your questions. I know there are more out there, but we're gonna have to wrap things up. And I'm gonna ask you to do that by, um, and I do encourage everyone to stay for the reception afterward and talk to Young and Linda, we'll have more conversation. But I mean, this question about kind of, can you reform from within the system or do you need to kind of let that system die <laughs> is one that's provocative. And I just wonder for the models that you're proposing and the ideas that you have, what, what's the grand vision here? Is it to systematize them, to create a new system based on these principles? Is it to let 100 different kinds of entrepreneurial projects develop and see where they lead or artist-driven <laughs> projects and see where they go? What, what's the, 
the end goal? Well, I'd be, it'd be a really sad world if every design school put out the same stuff. It wouldn't be a world we'd want to live in. And I think that that goes for schools. Schools are unique, just like individuals are unique. And I think that schools can become known for something, and I think that's wonderful. It means the whole thing is working well together, and people who come out of it are enriched in that experience. But I think to try to make everything uniform and standard goes against the very grain of human nature. Well, so the, the change... <laughs> So the, the change is, uh, it's basically, I think you have, uh, have two approaches. One is a good approach, one is an evil approach. Okay. <laughs> the, 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 I'll start with evil approach. Okay. The evil <laughs> approach basically is that you, you began to protest, to say, I don't like this, because I really want, I'm not, not that naive. We as public schools or private schools, parents, we are under control by nonsensical bureaucratic reporting measures. It's making us lean us to run the wrong way. And unless we're actively trying to fight against that, that's going to prolong for a long time. My biggest concern, honestly, is that uh, we will have a new generation of teachers and educators who would not even know they could teach with much more autonomy. They will think the common core is what we've always had. We're born with that, is the, the, thing, the thing. Because the common core is precisely the, what, the opposite of what Linda described. The, the common, I don't care what the common core Many people come to claim the common core is great. It can do this, can do that. It's common and core. <laughs> and I have debated with many people. I said, I'm fine with the common core if they are not common or core. It's fine. It's, they're just simple <laughs> standards. So that's, that's the evil one, get protest. I think the good approach is that we as individuals, we can go home, try to create a little micro system for our own children. Our own children is in your family, in your classroom, in your school, in your neighborhood. You can create those little microcosms for them to free that. And hopefully gradually that grassroots could push for some change. This is the least resistant kind of resistant approach, but it may have the least impact. So you can work within, but the existing system is not going to transform itself. Nobody says, I'm going to kill myself and to have a new, <laughs> wife, new life. It's impossible. Dr. Young Zhao, his book is World Class Learners, and Linda Keen, her website is next.cc. I want to thank you both so much for joining us this evening. Thank, thank you, you, Allison. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. Thank you. Thank you.